Transform us, change us. Make us more like you, Jesus. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you, Susie. You have uh, you've blessed me. I appreciate you coming and leading us. And Yes, thank you. And lady with tremendous talent, just give it back to the Lord. And You know, that's basically all that's required of all of us, right? All right, turn to Psalm 139. You know me, I make you open your Bible, uh, your iPad or iPhone, I will give in to that. But I think if you will just feel the paper and have that with you, we're going to get there in a minute. I want to make a confession this morning. I've come to challenge you. I have had people tell me that, Pastor, you stretched me, and uh, probably true. But I only stretch as the Lord stretches me. The Christian life that we are called to, there's not a magic formula to it. The Christian life that we are called to has been plainly laid out into the Word of God. Now, you say, we're living in hard times. In fact, it would be a, a risk, an understatement that we are living in difficult times. Life is difficult. Uh, you know, things that we normally did, we hesitate. Uh, I know my wife and I will go to the store and we I'll shut the car off and she'll say, do we put a mask on? And we look around, you know, what do you do? And, and the problem with that is, if you really begin to worry so much, you get pressed down in your spirit. I think the Lord very plainly teaches us in, a, in his word. He has given us a mind in order to think and to have good judgment. But we should never, ever, ever move to the point where we doubt that our God is sovereign. This psalm that we're going to get to in a moment talks about, I believe, a person. Uh, when I begin to study different people who have written about this psalm, they say it is about someone who had run from the Lord and when he ran as far as he could run, he looked around and he realized that God had beat him to that point. And I don't think that psalm really says that. This to me is a psalm of a person who has become very comfortable in living in the presence of God. So comfortable that he realizes that there is nothing in this life that can separate him from the love of God, from the presence of God. He's come to this realization, and as we get to it and as we read the words, you'll see how he is thinking. And what happens when we become, uh, you may call it, comfortable in our skin? Uh, you know, as a new Christian, you're you're, you're excited, you're full of vitality, and, and, and you, you're just, you're ready. And, and, and fortunately, as we live life sometimes, uh, somebody has said we pour water on that fire. But when we become comfortable living every day, that through no fault of ours, because nothing that we can do, nothing we can say, nothing we can earn, God has called us to salvation, a salvation in this world and life in which we live, in which his scripture points out he equips us to live this life. It's not like he calls us and puts us out on our own and says, go. This word is instructions for life. Not only is that salvation for this life, it's for an eternity. You know, I, I talk to you know, people that are older than I am, and believe it or not, people that are older than I am can talk. Uh, and they will tell me how short 
how short life is. But when you think about eternity, man, you, you can't even describe eternity. Forever, that doesn't describe it. What is forever? We have never experienced forever. But one day we are. All because God looked into our lives. God saw where we were. God knew what we needed. And the amazing point is, is that this didn't start when we were born. We need to understand that before you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you, knew everything about you. I've had people tell me when they would have two children, maybe in their 20s, uh, ages, they were in their 20s. And then they'd have a little boy, like nine, and he'd say, he was a surprise. <laughs> and I've often wondered if that poor kid just carried this thing on him that one day he just showed up at mom and dad's door, you know, and we caused him to go into some kind of psychotic reaction, and he suffers in life. I don't know. Psychologists makes all kind of stuff up. No one is a surprise. Your life is not a surprise. We simply are called to live up to that life. Now, the call that I speak about this morning is not the call to salvation, but the call to discipleship. You see, I think that's the most undertaught doctrine in the Word of God. The call to discipleship. This call goes beyond what we have come to learn as easy believism. You know what that is. All you have to do is say certain words, fill out a form, give it to them, be baptized. That's all you got to do. From then on, you're just living life. And people have bought into that, that all I'm called to do is be a child of God. And salvation is simply the beginning. It is a beginning call. And that call was not to just simply follow. It was to be a disciple. If you read the Gospels they're, they're, and, and you read them over and over, different things begin to surface. And the one thing that I found one time was that there was a difference between the disciples that God used and sent out and the vast followers, the crowd that that Christ always drew everywhere it went. In fact, as I begin to look at all of that crowd and I go over to the book of Acts and, and Christ has now been crucified, he's placed in a grave, he is resurrected, he has appeared to his disciples, he has ascended into heaven and the believers of Christ's ministry are gathered in one room and they're counted as 120. In today's resumes, as a leader or pastor, that wouldn't get you very far. But yet, you see, there, that shows me the distinct difference. Those who come for what is on Jesus' table, he fed 5,000 on the mountaintops. They come for his healing. They want their life settled. But you see, there is an exchange in the Christian life. And the word discipleship should not bring fear into you. It simply means that you are growing into a more intimate knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and a part of that knowledge is this. You become fully aware that your life is not yours. The scriptures even said, your life is not yours. You have been bought with a price. But yet, being bought with a price, we are not in slavery. In fact, Christ has set us free. And the role of a disciple is to walk close to the source of that freedom in which God has given us through Christ. Part of that is to realize every person is gifted by the Holy Spirit for ministry. Every person has a gift. There is not, however, the gift of just coming. I had a lady tell me one time in my church, Pastor, I'm not a teacher, 
Uh, she went through. A, she had her list memorized of everything that she was not, and she said, "The Lord called me to just come and sit." And I said, "Sister, you do a wonderful job of that, but perhaps you need to check the gifts of the Spirit once more." You see, in reality, I want you to know this morning. Every person that is called by Christ to salvation is a missionary. You're a missionary. When I came to this church, I went down to the county and got one of those great big maps, and I had the addresses of everybody that was a member of this church. And I began to kind of make mental notes. They wouldn't let me have it make mental notes of where people lived that called this church their membership. And what I discovered was is that God has gathered a group here to adequately cover Flagler County, to adequately cover Bunnell, Palm Coast, Flagler Beach, Beverly Beach, Painters Hill. Wherever there is a place, we have been called together as the body of Christ in order to minister in that area. And I grant you, there are specific calls. There's the call of a pastor, the call of evangelists, the call of teachers. There are specific calls, but every Christian has been called to be a missionary. Now, Maybe, you know, you're saying, well, pastor, you just love missions. So you say, no, that's all a disciple is. A disciple is one who goes, and he goes into his area of service. Now, there are times that you will travel. There are many who have gone with, to Egypt with me. We've, we've gone to different places uh, across the world. And yes, that's involved in the call. But we need to understand in the Great Commission, when Jesus said to go, he began where he was, and that was Jerusalem. And I want to point out, the Great Commission is not an either or. It's not community. It's not or international. It's not or state. No. It, it's the commission that God gave us. He has equipped the church to fully go from where we are to the uttermost parts of the earth and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the ways we do that every Sunday is back here. This message goes throughout all of the world. We go to put our feet down. The people where you live is the most important mission field that you will ever see. You see, coming to Jesus Christ will shake your life up. We don't tell people that sometimes. When you come to Christ, it's going to shake your whole life up. It, just as a physical death, there's pain and a disruption of your life. When you begin to die spiritually to your old man, there is pain pain of losing habits, pain of losing thoughts, and allegiance from self to God. There is this process of moving from the old into the new. And part of that is the call of God in Christ. Now, let me say to you, doctrine is very, very important. In fact, I can say on behalf of Andrew and Doug that the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ is preached from this pulpit. We don't preach our thoughts, our view on things we preach, thus saith the Lord. And one of the most important doctrines of Christ, God that I know, I believe is the foundation that God is sovereign. Now I know people will say that, but my question to you this morning, do you believe it? Do you believe that God is sovereign when he calls you out of your comfort zone? Do you believe that God is sovereign when he requires that you do something you've never done before? Do you believe God is sovereign in all ways when he asks you to sacrifice certain things in your life? 
You see, God is either sovereign all the time or he's not God, he is not sovereign at any time. You see, God is in control of every event in life, all of life, all the places in the world. There's no luck, there's no uh, accidents, no happenstance. God is sovereign over creation. He is sovereign over mankind. Now, it may be hard to wrap your mind around the fact that just like God knows what's going on as a unit here, he knows what's going on in each individual mind, and at the same time, everything across the world. That may be hard to get your head around, but it's one of those things that you just simply yield to and begin to use that as a part of your armor. Times are rough. Things are not normal. I don't understand what's going on, but God is sovereign. Because if we think any other way, we begin to slip back. We begin to fear. We begin to hold back. And before long, we begin to doubt God. Adversity, suffering is difficult to face. The unknown is difficult to face. But when we know God is in control, there's nothing that we can't face. Nothing. Listen, we glorify God when we acknowledge his sovereignty. We're encouraged in scripture. God demonstrates his truth. But you know what? You can know every doctrine and be able to quote it in the Word of God. But until you put that doctrine to use, to acts into your life, to become your life, you're like a book of knowledge sitting on a shelf that just within itself will never help you. I tried to get through algebra by sleeping on the algebra. I heard osmosis works. Osmosis, osmos got me an F in algebra. Friends, it's the same way. And we really don't emphasize this enough. The doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ is only as good for us as we Believe it and put it into action. That's where the call of God comes. I want to announce this morning, every person sitting here has an individual call from God for something. Everyone here, no one's escaped. And I, th I thought about how would I illustrate this? Well, I, I, I went to the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. And, and let me just say as an aside, if you have never gone to Hebrews chapter 11, and when you read a name, search a scripture to find out about that life, you've missed out on the story of Hebrews 11. Now, Abraham, we all know, and Abraham was just simply called to go from where he was to, to a direction. Because God said, I, I'll show you where you go. And so he just set sail and waited for God to tell him, here it is. In fact, the scriptures record Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. But it wasn't that he stayed in Mesopotamia and said, God, I believe that you will bless me and I believe that all the families in the earth will be blessed through me and he stayed in Mesopotamia. He believed that to the, to the rhythm of his feet going where God told him to go. I'm going to briefly mention three other guys who were called in similar times as ours. Ours is a time of confusion. Ours is a time when the nation has totally turned from God. We are living in a woke generation, and I think it's time they went back to sleep. But that's what they call them. They woke up one day and thought something should be, and if they were a famous basketball player, everybody said, Oh, he scores 30 points a game. He must have the words of life. Or an actor will dream and decide, this is the thing that ought to be. And everybody says, they have an Oscar. And they want an Emmy. They're a great actor or actress. They must know 
what they're talking about. And we change our minds. But you see, the woke generation has totally disregarded that God is sovereign over this earth. And just because it seems that everything we see in our papers and hear on the nose and see in the actions of people says God is not in control, God has not given up his authority. God has called a people. There was a guy named Isaiah. You know him? He wrote 66 books in one little book, 66 chapter in one book. Isaiah's call came when a close personal friend happened to be a king, King Uzziah. He served in the court of the king, and he died. And it said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He saw the Lord high, lifted up. He saw that the train of his robe filled the room. He heard the angels singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Isaiah, on response of seeing God, said, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live in a land of unclean people. But God still said, Behold, I have have touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned. Then the call, And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And where shall, who will go for us? And Isaiah responded, Here am I, Lord. Send me. He was sending Isaiah to a rebellious people who would soon be conquered and overthrown. That was the call. It landed Isaiah in a lot of trouble. There was my man, Jeremiah. I love Jeremiah. Jeremiah. He come in contact with God, and God just put him right in his place. He said, Jeremiah, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And I'm convinced Jeremiah was Baptist. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to prove it by Scripture. Jeremiah said, oh, wait a minute. I don't know how to speak. I'm only a use. Excuses. There used to be a southern gospel song, Excuses, for you southern gospel people. But here's what God said. Don't say I'm only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you will go. And whoever I command you, you shall speak. And don't be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. And the Lord put his hand and touched my mouth. And he said, I put my words in your mouth. And this is your ministry to pluck up, break down, destroy, overthrow, but plant and to build. When you read Jeremiah, you find out God said, Jeremiah, I'm going to send you to these people, but they're not going to listen to you. They threw Jeremiah in a pit filled with water. They, they tried to starve him. They made him uh, escape and, and go to Egypt. Jeremiah lived a life of hardships. In fact, when you read the book of Lamentations, which is written by Jeremiah, it's full of woes, it's full of laments of a broken heart watching God's city be destroyed. And yet, Jeremiah went, not being assured of any victory at all. One other guy, Ezekiel. I love Ezekiel. Ezekiel's call, he saw the Lord. And he fell on his face. He said to him, Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. Son of man, I send you to a people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. I send them to you. You shall say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, and whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among you. Do you get the picture I'm trying to paint? Anybody will go when they are assured of victory. Thirty years ago, it was easy to get people to gather at a church on Tuesday night. Seemed to be our night, Tuesday night, where we swooped in to the visitors who had visited us on Sunday. 
and knocked on their door and, and began to talk to them. I remember in the church that I formerly was in, over 150 people, 100 to 150 would meet on Monday night and have a meal, and they would go out knocking on doors. We say now we can't do that because we live in gated communities, and yet we're not all in gated communities. You see, the thing that we look, when you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, they found a way to obey the call of God. But in a greater sense, I want you to know that these three men, they were not superheroes of the faith. They had flaws. They had failures. They were just like you and I. What was the sense that drove them? It was the fact that they knew God was sovereign. And they would follow, they would go, they would obey. Did you get what God said Ezekiel is to do? You see, when we preach, when we share with our friends, and the reason I say you're missionaries in your community, you're living among people who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and they are struggling with the house in which they're going through. And when they see you going through day by day, not being knocked down, there, there is a desire to know what do you have? What do you know that I don't know? And what do we proclaim? We proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Psalms 139. Hope you have found it by now. I've given you ample time. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all of my ways. As I said, I do not believe this is a psalm written by a man or with the intention of showing that he tried to run from God, and God finally found him. I think this is a man who is involved every day following Christ, every day being faithful to his word, and he, he runs into hardships like we all do. He runs into failures. In fact, there's times, no doubt, that he miserably failed in what he attempted to do and in the life that he attempted to live. And you see, today you need to understand as long as you live in this flesh, you will no doubt fail, you'll falter, but God said when you fall, I'll catch you before you fall face first. He was rehearsing, I think, how, what, what, where his strength come from. I remember playing football and you're intent on exactly what you're supposed to do, but you're aware of, if you're a halfback, what your lineman's doing. And, and there's times that you, you run and you can't make it, you run and you can't make it. Kind of reminds me of the Florida Gators. They'll run the same play 20 times. It won't work 20 times, but they think one day it will. But you remember. You remember the time that you succeeded. You remember that time you were bold in the Lord. You remember that time that words just flowed out of you and compassion and help to those people that needed that encouragement. This man is sitting there and saying, there's nothing about me God doesn't know. And if there is something that we need to shake today as Christians, it's the fact that we can hide from God. Uh, you know, the stupid television ads, go to Vegas, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I got news for you. Then. There's nothing that we think is hidden is hidden. And yet we live our lives fooling ourselves, and we wonder why our minds in disarray, and we live a miserable life. It's because we're living a lie and we're telling ourselves the lie and believing it. 
There is nothing that God does not know about you. He says this, Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. What do you think about that? Oops. Before you say a word. In fact, this guy says, you hem me in behind and before. And not only that, you lay your hand on me. He's saying that I am securely in the grip of God. You see, the Christians of today and yesterday, we are called of God to go against the grain of life. We have never been called to conform to this world system, this sinful system, this uh, every kind of ideology that you can think of. We have never been called. We are to stand alone in Christ because this is the point of truth. Listen, if you bought a house, you've had people come out and survey your property. And there's always that point right there that they set every bit of your property bounds in order for it to be a legal description. That point in this world as Christians are the beginning point of life for those that are dying in their sins, dying in their depressions, dying in their heartbreaks, dying because they have no hope. And this is a standard that is steadfast and true. And it's true because God is sovereign. And when we stand on that truth, no matter what comes against us, front and back and his hand on us. God, when he sins, no one can stop. What about this? He said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain it. He's thinking about this. In Christ, we are invincible. Is that an overstatement? I don't think it is because the scripture says in Christ I can do all things who strengthens me. In fact, our lives should be lives in which we dream dreams we cannot fulfill. Because when we dream dreams that only God can fulfill, then it's the hand of God. And the glory goes to God. He said, I can't think about this. And then all of a sudden, he says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? Uh, if I ascend to the heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. I want you to grasp these truths because they're yours as a child of God. And I want you to grasp them because I want to tell you what Jesus said was the cost of discipleship. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword, for I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and person's enemies will be those of their own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whosoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life shall lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Those come under the headings of hard words of Jesus. Now, Jesus isn't talking about picking an argument he is talking about that within the members of your own family, when you make this commitment and Christ calls and you grasp that call of salvation, you need to understand it doesn't matter if father or mother, or mother-in-law, father-in-law, any of the family come against you. You are to stand in that call and often the, the call of Christ does not bring peace in the family as assuredly as it will not bring peace in the world. But that's what we're called to. When Jesus said, 
take up his cross. The cross is an implement of death. What is it that we die? Paul said, I die to myself every day. The things I would normally want, the things that I would normally think, the things that I would normally say, the things that I would normally not do, we're to die. He went further. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus told his disciple, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, and whoever would lose his life for my sake will find it. For what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give and return for his soul? There are hard sayings in Scripture that we choose not to read. We choose to ignore them because they will bring you. Scripture has said in Isaiah 55 that as that word goes out, it will accomplish exactly why God sent the word out. It will accomplish the conviction of sin and the drawing to repentance and the drawing to God or it will cause a conflict in your life when you reject that call from God. You see, we can't save ourselves by being disobedient to God. And we cannot say, I don't know how I will do this. When God has said he would provide the way, he would provide the means, you, we are to provide the body. One other thing I bring up was a parable in Luke 14. It, the parable was a, a, a man. Uh, Jesus was talking to some Pharisees, and uh, he kind of reclined back towards Jesus. And he said, blessed is everyone who will, eat, who will eat the bread in the kingdom of God. It was like, I, I think from that context, he was just patting himself on the back because he was having bread with Jesus, and he was content. Jesus told a parable. He said there was a man that gave a dinner, and he sent out invitations. And on the day that that dinner was to come, he sent his servants out to tell those who had been invited to come. Here was their response. One said, I just bought five oxen, and I need to go and examine them. One said, I just bought some land. I need to go look at it. Another one said, I've just married my wife, and I need to be with her. Now, what do you think about those excuses? You see, we're living in time, if you can come up with an excuse, anybody will believe anything. Now, who would buy five, one ox and much less five without looking at them? Can you tell me? That's called in the country, buying a pig and a pope. Who would buy land without looking at it? I can answer that. Thousands of people in the north, when they bought waterfront property in Florida and found out that the property was not only waterfront, it was underwater. Do you, do you see the foolishness of excuses? And in fact, any excuse that says to God, I can't do or complete what you've called me to do is a slap in the face of God because he already knows you can because he has provided the means. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the other most parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, see the excuses, if I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light around me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. For night is as bright as the day and darkness is as light to you. And then this man comes to some information and belief that our world is for God. For you, O oh God, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. 
My soul knows, knows it very well. My frame is not hidden from you. When I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them the days that you were formed for me, when yet there was not one. Every soul, every person is created by God, for God, and has value. We're living in a time when society of, of assigns what is valuable and what is not. But I am afraid sometimes we as Christians, we forget that every person was intimately created and formed. And God knew their days. He knew everything that, that would be about their life. When we begin to decide who needs to hear the gospel and who doesn't need to hear the gospel. You say, preacher, I've never done that. We have when we have been afraid or have failed to go where people are that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have heard we don't want to associate with those people. And I've heard those people shouldn't be around our children. And when I read Scripture, I read that every person was created by God. They were created for God. And when they are away from God, God created a body of Christ, an army, that is to go and pursue those who don't know Christ. And every person, every person needs Jesus Christ. And you see, when we put this separation stuff, we're being taught now to be racist. You know, uh, segregation has been, I read an article the other day. <laughs> we're going back to where they're putting segregation in. It's like <laughs> going back to the, to the future. It's ignorance. And we're doing it because we don't live and the knowledge of a sovereign God that created the world and us for a purpose. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, there would be more than sand. I awake. I'm still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God, O oh man of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? I do, not, I do not loathe those. I loathe those who rise up against you. I hate them with a complete hatred. I count them as my enemies. What is he saying there? We need a healthy hate for sin, exactly as our God hates We become conditioned. We were talking in the office this week about how television has changed. We went from Bob Newhart and Suzanne Fleshett in single beds. And then uh, when they moved and allowed them in a single bed, both of them had to be sitting up apart from each other and pajamas on. Where have we slid now? Will and Grace came along. The little guy was funny. And everybody laughed. And Satan kept us laughing until one of the laws of the land, not the law of the God, is that anybody can marry anybody at any time. You must attain a healthy hate for sin, if nothing more than what it did for your life. This is my prayer every morning. I urge it to be your prayer. Because just as this man checked the facts and became settled in Christ, so should we. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous, any hurtful way in me. And lead me into the way of everlasting life. I don't know when and where or what the next thing that's going to happen. 
But when I read scripture and see the events of this world, it's almost like God is saying, something's got to happen. Something's got to happen. And the terror of my heart is that I know people personally, and I know other people in communities that don't know Christ. They've never seen that Christ model. They've never been with him. In church, we've been called. We've been created. The church is not this building. The church is each of, each of us. I challenge you to search your heart. Ask God to search it. Show him to show you where, what he has for you. And then I want you to go confidently. Go confidently into the night. Nothing's going to overthrow you. Fathers, we come to you this morning. Lord, your words and your promises truly do give us life. Father, I pray if there's a person this morning that does not know you as Savior and Lord of their life, that this morning would be the time that they would come. And Father, I pray as you look at this wonderful body of Christ and the community that we are to serve, I pray that a result of this message would be open hearts, open minds, and open hands. And as Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand?